If you enjoy fun baseball, tonight's slate is one for you because there are a lot of starting pitchers on tonight's slate that I would put in the fun bucket. Guys who I think are objectively a delight to watch, whether it be because they're a good story like Nesta Cortez or because they're the best baseball player on the planet and Shohei Otani. We got a lot of good guys who are super, super fun and I really enjoy both watching and using for DFS all kind of converging on this one slate. And our job is to whittle that down and decide, okay, which of these fun options am I going to use? Which will I prioritize? Which one will I potentially fade for tonight and see how that goes? So it's a lot to dissect. Let's dive on in and get you set for Thursday night slate. Welcome on into the solo shot. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and numberfire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Here to break down Thursday's 10 game main slate, which once again will lock at 6 40 p.m. Eastern. So again, Earlier lock for today than usual. 6.40 p.m. Eastern is locked for today. Make sure you get those lineups set before then uh, in case you are someone who likes to procrastinate with getting those entries in. There is some weather in the forecast for today. Uh, there's a chance of rain in Detroit for the Tigers and Guardians. Doesn't seem too bad, but I would check back on that one later. Atlanta is much worse. That is the problem child of this slate. Uh, rain odds do decrease as the night goes along, but I would proceed with caution with the Braves and Phillies. I think there's a pretty good shot that game does not play. Rain is possible in St. Louis for the Cardinals and the Brewers. They should play, but check back on that one later. And then in Chicago for the White Sox and Red Sox, rain odds increase as the night goes along. So the timing of that rain will dictate if they can finish it. I think they'll start it, but check back on that one later as well. So again, Atlanta, Chicago, Detroit, and St. Louis, the key trouble spots to keep an eye on for tonight. We'll dive on into the pitching preview in just one second. But first, a quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed because we have MLB podcasts every weekday. We've got PGA podcasts every week. We've got NASCAR podcasts, UFC podcasts when they have an event, all right in the same place. So hit subscribe and get those podcasts right as they go up. Maximize your post-listening research time to get those right as they're up. Uh, and if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Hey, soccer fans, this season, FanDuel and Captain Morgan are teaming up to give you a one-of-a-kind soccer to contest to spice up game day. Introducing Captain Morgan Soccer Pick'em, a weekly fantasy contest that is entirely free to play. The contest is simple. All you have to do is answer 10 questions about Captain Morgan and that week's soccer matchup. People with the most correct answers will earn their share of cash prizes. Head over to FanDuel.com slash free games slash Captain Morgan and spice up game day with a free shot of cash prizes every Saturday. No purchase necessary. Must be 21 plus to enter. Location restrictions apply. The void were prohibited. See full terms at FanDuel.com. Pitching preview for this Thursday main slate. Eric Lauer is the highest salary guy in FanDuel checking in at $10,600, followed by Tarek Skubal, or sorry, Nestor Cortez at 10-3. Tarek Skubal is 10-1. Shohei Otani down to $9,900. Martin Perez, really fun this year, $9,700. Kyle Wright in that potential rain in Atlanta is 95. We've got Adam Wainwright checking in at 91 with Aaron Nola, Frankie Montas, and Michael Waka as the others at $8,000 or higher. Now, it's a, re a really good slate, as mentioned, and we haven't had a lot of good slates on a Thursday. So it's been odd uh, to research this and be like, oh, wow, I don't have to like scrounge for good pitchers for tonight. And Shohei Otani isn't a tough matchup for tonight, but I still think he is going to be my top arm despite that. He's facing the Jays, and there are a lot of great hitters in that lineup. I haven't done a ton with it yet. They've got a 97 WRC plus against righties. Their walk rate is low. The power number is not too scary yet. So although I'm not actively targeting the Jays, I think that I think that they'll get better as the, the year goes along, but I'm not going to turn them down when an ace like Otani is the guy facing them. And Otani had already proven this, but he's legitimizing the fact that he is a full-blown ace. He I talked before his most recent start about a slight dip in his velocity. And that always scares me because there's so much wear and tear on him. Like he's, he goes through a lot and I am sensitive to those things. Like eh, a little bit wary of velocity dips. That velo dip went away in his most recent start, which means that we can put more weight in the full season numbers for Otani. And those are obviously tremendous. He has a 34% strikeout rate, 2.45 skill interactive ERA. And both of those are the best marks on the slate, despite a really tough competition for him, for sure. 
He's got a decent pitch count uh, in general. I've got Otani projected for 95 pitches tonight, which translates to 8.2 strikeouts projected for me. That is second behind Nola, who is very much at risk of rain out, tends to have a dip on the road. Otani's at home. So the Jays, super tough team. I don't want to get in the habit of going at them, but in this spot, I'm okay with it just because Otani is disgusting. So Shohei Otani will be my top pitcher for today. After Otani, we have a lot of options for our second slot of pitcher. So that may make it silly to use a guy coming off of an injury in a short start. But I feel good about Frankie Montas, and I will put him second on this list. Let's talk about the injury first, because Montas took a line drive off his hand last week. Didn't look good, and it limited him to less than two innings. But reading the tea leaves kind of seems like he's healthy. His x-rays were negative. He was able to throw his bullpen this week. He was listed on Wednesday as being the starter for Thursday, which means they were not waiting to see how he felt. You often see that with guys who are injured. They won't list the starter ahead of time. They did that with Montas here. That increases my confidence in using him in this spot, which means I can view Montas as what he's been this year, which is a good pitcher in a good matchup. In nine starts, Montas has a 3.09 skill interactive ERA with a 27% strikeout rate. And he's keeping the ball out of the air as well. He's facing the Rangers here. Their WRC plus against righties is still down to 85. They have a 24% strikeout rate with a low walk rate. They did face Montas once back on April 23rd. So more than a month ago, no familiarity issues here. And Montas in that game had eight strikeouts and seven and one third innings. We get him at home tonight as well. So I understand looking elsewhere if you are concerned about the hand injury for Montas. But personally, I have enough confidence in his health and enough confidence in him as a pitcher to be high on him here. So Frankie Montas, to me, is going to be number two behind Shohei Otani. Now, Montas does count as our value play here, checking in at $8,800. So the whole board is open, up, open to us for the third slot, which I appreciate because I wanted to talk about Nestor Cortez at 10-3. Didn't get the chance to talk about him above Otani or Montas, but I will give him the slight edge here over Tarek Skubal, who will discuss some things to watch. Cortez is facing the race. They are not as much of a high strikeout team as they used to be because their active roster has just a 19% strikeout rate against lefties this year. So I'm going here because of Cortez, not because of the matchup. I believe in the hot start he has had because his skill interactive ERA is 2.69 in eight starts with a 32% strikeout rate. And he's done that while facing some pretty tough teams. Cortez has faced Toronto twice, he faced the White Sox twice, and both those teams have a lot of lefty bashers. But in 13 innings against the White Sox in consecutive starts, he had 14 strikeouts, did let up four in runs, but I think in that spot, that's pretty acceptable. The Rays, not a big strikeout team, but they also are not hitting for a lot of power against lefties. Their ISO is just 118. And that's reassuring for me so, because Cortez does let up some fly balls. So I prefer to target him against lower power teams. And the Rays, at least this year, have been that against lefties. There's a lot of upside in Cortez. He's had double-digit strikeouts twice. He had seven-plus strikeouts three other times. And he's gotten seven or more in each of his past three outings. Plus, the Yankees are letting Cortez go deep now. He has had 103, 99, and 100 pitches across his past three starts. I've got Cortez projected for 7.4 strikeouts tonight. That ranks third on the slate behind Nola and Otani. So he is above Montas for me, and I will happily be in on Cortez here. I think that he's capable of being the SP1 on the slate. I will just have less of him than I have Otani and Montas. So to me, the rankings of pitcher for tonight, Shohei Otani 1, Frankie Montas 2, Nestor Cortez 3. We'll talk about how to handle Tara Skubal in things to watch. Before that, though, let's dive into some stacks. And we stacked against, stacked the Twins against Daniel Lynch last week. And that worked out pretty well because Lynch let up four runs across three and two-thirds innings. Now he's facing them again for a second consecutive time, which means we should stack the Twins here once again. The interesting thing about the start last week is that it, it wasn't long balls. There were no dingers in that game. And that's the thesis behind stacking against Lynch is because he he get lets up a lot of hard contact and a lot of fly balls were dinger hunting. And we didn't get those there, but it did still work out. But the Twins had six hard hit balls in that game. They had a barrel in that game. That's a good shot that one of those leaves if it happens again. We have seen Lynch trying to change. He's throwing more changeups across his past four starts, which is a good tool for a lefty to try to neutralize righties. It didn't work in that Twins game. 
Hasn't worked overall because his uh, skill interactive ERA in that time is 5.29 with a 51% fly ball rate. So he is tinkering, hasn't quite found the fix just yet. The Twins are a team that can bash lefties. They have a 128 WRC plus in a small sample with just a 20% strikeout rate. I would expect Lynch to figure it out eventually because he is a guy who can get whiffs and that's super valuable, but he's not there yet. So I think it's worthwhile to keep stacking against him until that does happen. Now, Byron Buxton, I know it's like a running joke how often I talk about him, and he's in a slump. Uh, but I do still want to prioritize him in these stacks, assuming he plays, which he may not because he started three straight games. They're trying to manage his uh, manage his load. Makes sense. Um, so he might not play today. We haven't seen Buxton get a hit since, I don't think it's May 15th. I think that's the most recent time is May 15th. Um, his hard hit rate in that time, though, is 44%. So he's still striking the ball hard. It's not striking out a whole lot. His strikeout rate has actually come down in that time. So I think he's just getting unlucky. He's had a couple of warning track fly balls recently. I'll be in on him here if he plays. Again, I'm not totally convinced he will just because the the management plan they've had him on might dictate a a day off today. Totally fine if that happens. Uh, I would still sack the Twins without him. But if he does play, I don't think this this slump will stick around too long. So my boy, Byron Buxton, is still going to be firmly in my thoughts for tonight. For the number two stack, I'm going back to the Dodgers once again tonight. They are in Arizona. The roof will be closed. So we do have to bump the park factor down a bit to account for that. But I'm still in on them here. They're facing Humberto Castellanos. And Castellanos does have good numbers across his seven starts this year. He's got a 4.13 ERA, a 4.9 or 4.29 skill interactive ERA. And those are pretty solid. But Castellanos hasn't faced many powerful teams. Those seven starts have all come against teams rank 14th or lower in ISO against righties, whereas the Dodgers rank fourth there. That's big because Castellanos is not a high strikeout pitcher. He has an 18% strikeout rate in his seven starts. And against a low power team, that's not a huge issue because the ball in play is not as impactful there as it will be against a a scarier team. The Dodgers are scary. Uh, They have a 40% fly ball rate this year. They should put the ball in play plenty in this spot. So, Castellanos is not a guy I'd stack against with any offense, but with this specific, very disgusting lineup, I will. So the Dodgers, for me, second behind the Twins for stacking for tonight. I found myself using a lot of Max Muncy this past week. Part of it is the low salary, but I also do believe he will hit for power here pretty soon. His ISO against righties is just 156. That's pretty underwhelming, but a 55% fly ball rate, the hard hit rate is still decent. So I think the power will come soon, at least against righties. And Muncy gives you good, low salary exposure to this offense. So I think that I'm still in on him personally. I, I will keep on using him. I would mention that, you know, Evan Rios is still a super low salary guy. They're using him more and more against righties. So keep on going there. But I want to highlight the fact that I'm okay with Muncy, despite the fact 2022 has been a, a pretty rough year for him so far. Finally, assuming they're able to play, I will rank the Red Sox third for stacking. They're facing Dallas Keuchel, and Keuchel is a frustrating guy to stack against because he gets more ground balls than you would like, ideally. For the full season, Keuchel has a 54% ground ball rate. His hard hit rate is 32%. Both those numbers are very good. But the ERA for Keuchel is still 6.60. That's because he has more walks and strikeouts in this time. So on the off chance he does make a mistake, it's not a solo home run. It's typically a pretty big issue when he does let up a hard hit ball. We've seen that in reality so far this year because he let up six earned runs, his most recent start. He let up seven across one inning to the Guardians back in April. When he faced the Red Sox, the same team he faced tonight earlier on, he did not implode. He let up just two earned runs across six innings, but now he's facing them a couple weeks later. And the Red Sox did get a couple of barrels in that game. So it's frustrating to see, you know, a lot of ground balls in the profile. I typically want to sack against guys who give us higher long ball potential. And that's not as big of a thing with Keuchel, but I do still think that it's the right move to stack against him on this slate. So the Red Sox for me, the number three stack behind the Twins and the Dodgers for tonight. I do want to talk about Do- or Bobby Dahlbeck for a second. He should bat eighth, and he should benefit with Keuchel being a low strikeout guy. The question is whether that's enough to overcome Dahlbeck's issues this year. And I'm not sure it does, honestly, because... It's not just the strikeouts, like the strike rate's down, but like at what cost? Because his barrel rate is 8%. That's I think below average. 
Um, the hard hit rate is down for Dahlbeck. So I'll consider him. I'm not opposed to that. But it seems like his swing is off a bit right now. It's kind of weird. So usually, you know, like last year against the lefty, Dahlbeck was like an auto play for me. He had a low salary, double dong potential. He, I will use him, but he will not be a focal point for me, which is different from how I used him last year. So Dahlbeck's still on the menu, but I think it's worth highlighting that he's getting knocked down for me a pretty decent amount as a result of the issues specifically with his bad at ball profile this year. Things to watch. I do like Tarek Skubal tonight. Uh, just a couple of drawbacks for me that pushed him below Cortez. The first is that he's facing Cleveland for the second straight start. He just saw them last week. He did have five strikeouts and in five innings before leaving due to an injury, but just a 7.6% swinging strike rate in that game for Skubal, which is a slight concern for me. So it's a repeat matchup. He wasn't overpowering them last week. That's enough for me to put Scuba below Cortez while still liking him. Again, I'm not saying don't use him. I probably will get there if I had to guess, uh, but those are the concerns. That's why he's not above Otani, Montas, or Cortez for me. I do think you can consider the Diamondbacks against Mitch White tonight. White is still ramping up off the COVID list, so probably not a full, full start for him. And he's struggled in his two outings since he returned. One of those was against Arizona. He allowed two runs, one of which was earned across one in the third innings. The Phillies hit him hard over the weekend. It's a good offense for stacking the Diamondbacks are, and I think that they're an option in addition to the Dodgers in this very same game. Again, downgrade the park factor with the roof being closed, but they're still a good option for me for tonight. I'm also okay stacking the Angels again tonight. Didn't really work out last night, but facing Hunjin Ryu here, he struggled with hard contact in a small sample this year. And that's while his strikeout rate is down at 15%. So I think the Angels work for stacking. Got Mike Trout, Anthony Rendon, Taylor Ward, if he can play, Max Stassi, if he can play. Uh, they can all hit lefties pretty well. So I'm on board with the Angels in the spot, given that they are facing Ryu. Uh, despite the fact I can't use Otani as a batter, I still think the Angels are very much in play. Let's finish up here with some dinger calls. I tried really hard not to go Byron Buxton. You know, I, I think that... Uh, I, I want to use a twin against Daniel Lynch. And I think that Buxton has a, like, I think if he plays, it's the eruptions very soon. Although I think there's a good chance he doesn't play. So if Byron Buxton sits, give me Carlos Correa. He's had a lot of hard hit balls recently. I think that he'll snap into it pretty soon too. So Buxton, if he plays Correa, if not, but I know I'm a parody of myself at this point. Sorry. It is what it is. The fun one. I'll go David Peralta. Peralta facing Mitch White. He's had some hard contact issues this year. Peralta this year is a 49% fly ball rate. I wish he had done this back when the dynasty league I had him in was still active. It is no longer a thing. So a bit sad about that. But Peralta's always hit the ball hard. Just didn't loft it enough. And suddenly that's changed. And it's made him a really fun guy. So home run calls Byron Buxton slash Carlos Correa and then David Peralta for tonight. That is all that we have here for today on the solo shop, but we are back once again tomorrow to get you set for a Friday main slate to get that. Plus our NASCAR USC and PGA podcast. Make sure you are subscribed to the number fire daily fantasy podcast feed, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. If you, <clears throat> you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your MLB DFS lineups. So we'll talk to you once again tomorrow to get you set for Friday Slate. This has been the solo shot right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.